second year of Burrows and Burbs, episode 44. Today, we have Noah Rosenblatt, CEO and founder of Urban Digs and host of the podcast Talking Manhattan, uh, both of which are focused on data and the New York City real estate market. And very happy to have you. I think you know Roberto for quite some time. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you come to know Roberto and tell us a little bit about Urban Dicks. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me, first off. I'm very excited to be here. I know Roberto for many, many, many years. Um, I met Roberto when I started Urban Digs. I think he, he was one of the very um, early adopters. You know, I had, I had a lot of agents that were um, the beginning cult, you know, that helped me grow this company. They would, they would be the ones that, that told me all the, the things I needed to do to make this thing better. It started very, very slowly. Um, and Roberto is one of those guys. So I know Roberto a long time. Um, respect him. He's awesome. So when he asked me to do this, I was totally honored. And but were um, you a realtor or you came out of the trading yeah, industry? So I, I was a, I was a day trader before I was a real estate agent. Um, I'm really a trader. <laughs> it's kind of weird to say, but real estate's trading. Um, it's just different. Um, I, I've been following the stock markets and the equity markets and the credit markets for a long, long time since, yeah, since I was like a, a teenager. Um, and I was trading from um, 1998 to about 2003 or so, 2004. So I was right, right in that, that trading period um, where the dot-com industry went crazy and then, and then busted. Um, and then I got into real estate. So, um, you know, I was a trader first and, and, you know, I think a lot of people look at urban digs and they kind of see the trading element um, of that to the real estate market. Your lexicon also has a lot of trading terminology in it. Bid ask was not, yeah. it, was, it was offer, whatever. And you, you brought that bid in. Yeah. Spread. It's all about the bids. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, people got to think about that. It's, it's all about the bids. It's all about the frequency of bids. How many bids, where are the bids? Are they close to ask? Are they above ask? Are they falling? You know, it's all about that spread between the bid ask. You know, back in back in early 2020, when the market shut down, it was all about gap down bids. That's all the trading terminology. That's like waking up one day. You can kind of relate to it today. Waking up one day and the stock market's down one and a half percent, two percent. You know, it's a gap down so situation. So for those of us who aren't very familiar with what you're talking about, this is the homepage of Urban Digs I put up on the screen. And and, and right up front, we see supply, contract signed, off market, and market pulse are being tracked over a one month period of time. And we mm -hmm. could also click on the one week and see the change week over week. And I guess that's why it looks kind of Bloomberg like. But can, explain mm -hmm. to us what, what I'm seeing in this chart and why it matters. Yeah, we call that the market ticker. We call that the market ticker. And if, you know, we're, we started as a chart company, we still are. A very proud chart company. There's a lot of charts. You know, if you think about charts that go back to 2008, you know, that's that's a kind of a macro look at it. Um, this ticker is is a microscope on the last four weeks. That's what the ticker is. So if you think about what the last four weeks is, the last four weeks is kind of powering what's going on. That's the trend. You know, it's an ongoing thing. It's constantly changing. It's the front end of the pipe. It's the market. You know, the evolving market over the next 30 days. So the one week is a seven day moving average. I'm sorry, a seven day uh, 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 total, window total, not an average, seven day total, and it moves, you know, seven days. So, so tomorrow, um, the new day will get phased in, today's data will get phased in, and then the last day gets phased out kind of thing. And then the 30 day is a 30 day um, moving total. So it's, it's, it's good to watch these things because um, it's a leading indicator of which way supply and, and contract activity is going. And over time, it gives you like a pulse gives you a pulse of the market, which in my position, um, I have to have because the agents are out there selling. That's hard enough as is doing their job. So they kind of rely on me to uh, tell, them, tell them what's going on. So what does it mean that market pulse has got a high, big, fat red line every week for months? What does that mean? And it's so, 77. Okay. So that, that 0 0.77, that's actually, um, that updates once a day. And that is a ratio of, of, of listings in contract to listings available for supply. Hit charts, so John. It, Hit charts um, John, on the left. Hit charts on the yeah. left. Okay. And then you'll see, you'll see what he's talking about across the top here. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right. Perfect. So if you see that market pulse 0 0.77, um, look at it. Pending sales is 4211. 
that's 77% of supply, which is 54.73 right next to it. So if you look at the two numbers next to market pulse up there, um, that 77 is a ratio of pending sales to supply. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good way of filtering out the noise of listing flow. I mean, we're looking at listing flow, we're looking at liquidity side, you know, the, the not, not price action. This is not prices, um, but it's a good way of looking at um, the relative uh, uh, ratio of, of things in contract to things available for supply. And as it rises, it's giving you a, a, um, a leverage situation that's going more towards sellers. And as it falls, it's giving you a leverage situation that's going more towards buyers. And that's actually going down. That's actually, that was actually at 0 0.9 about a month ago or a month and a half ago. And that's actually getting going down a little bit because supply is starting to go up. How is John, this quickly from expand a... that chart, John, expand the chart on market pulse and you on market pulse. Okay. Yeah. And is you click it? generate, Just generate, generate chart. chart. Yeah. Okay. And then you'll see how they have it set up or we're in a seller's market, but it's becoming a bit more favorable towards buying, but it's only because a lot of inventory is coming on. We haven't seen it move yet. Now, is this yeah, look different at, from absorption rate? We're familiar with that term out here in Connecticut. Yeah, absorption rate is, I, I don't very much like absorption rate because it's um, it's a bit lagging. It's because you need closed sales pace. You need closed sales, which in, this, in and of itself is kind of lagging. And the second reason I don't like absorption is because it, it combines two different time periods. So you're kind of looking at like the, the a two month lag at closed sales pace. And then you're looking at inventory, current inventory. So you're saying, all right, at that sales pace, how much will I absorb inventory? So I, I was never really a big fan of that. Um, I look at listing discount, um, which, which is negotiability, which moves in the same general direction as absorption. Um, so if you actually hit the back button and go back to those charts um, and you scroll down a little bit, um, if you just go to the charts again, there's a, a listing discount. I think that's a much better yeah, a little down right in the middle, median listing discount right there. That's going to follow a very similar trend um, as absorption, but it's pure closed sales information. And it's, and it's, I think it's more digestible um, because it's telling both buyers and sellers what their negotiability level is and which way it's going. Like you can clearly see that sellers have a nice advantage right now, even though they don't, I don't think they understand that they're not getting peak prices, but um, they're hoping for those, but they're in a, in a good market. So um, if I was to try and sum up what I've learned so far is that as an agent, I ought to be looking at median listing discount, but most of all, I should be looking at that market pulse in order to provide, what was the word, Roberto, perspective to my client and tell them whether that we are entering a period of time where they can be more aggressive on their pricing or less aggressive on their pricing. Is that fair? Yeah, that's very fair. And, 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 and to confuse you even more, if you hit the back button and go back, um, I, you know, I like to think about the market in terms of liquidity. Um, and when I say liquidity, we were talking about it earlier. We were talking about the bids, right? It's all about, it's all about the bids. Um, and there's a chart called monthly contract activity, which it, it shows you whether or not contract activity is higher or lower than what the normal, the normal range is. And I think every seller should be, every seller should see it, every buyer should see it too. But um, it's a great way of measuring whether or not there's a bid for Manhattan real estate. Um, and Roberto was talking about that earlier, that it's, it's, it's you know, it's all about the bids. Uh, yeah, there's monthly, see, there you go. So now if you just, yeah, stay there for a second. Um, it might be confusing when you first look at it, but that blue line, that blue line, those dots, those are monthly, that's how many contracts the industry brought in and signed. It's pure deal volume, right? The orange is giving you the historical average. So you could see that we're above versus COVID. Look how we were below in COVID, right? Um, you could see we're above. So it's a liquid market. So like any seller that's on the market right now is like, what's going on? I'm not selling right here. Well, there's low inventory. There's high demand. Um, there's a lot of deals being signed. Prices are going up. There's nothing wrong with the market. There's probably something wrong with your price. And I think agents are realizing that there's a correlation between these messages and, um, and getting, getting price decisions from, from clients. Roberto, do you find that your clients uh, listen to this and trust this data? When you come back to them and you say, your, house is, your, your apartment's not selling, um, but, and then you show them this chart and you say, there's plenty of buyers, there's plenty of activity in the market, you know, we've got to make a price change. 
Well, I've, I study this constantly. I mean, I look at this like every day. I open, typically open like an urban digs tab on my, uh, you know, internet browser. And I'm referring to it at different points throughout the day. Something might come up and I'm like, well, what about this? Oh, what about this? What about the average price per square foot during this time period or that time period or for four, you know, for three or four bedrooms. So I have this so in just the fabric of the way I think that I've already imparted a lot of this to my clients. Like I've managed their expectations on all of this. If they become doubtful or if they become resistant to something I'm trying to, to explain to them, then I will bring these charts and say, look, this is data. It's not just for me. You're, this is, these are numbers. This is real. Don't, you know, you don't have to believe me. You should believe that. Do they? Yeah. That's my question. You're it it makes guy. them very quiet. It humbles them and they know that it's correct. You know? And they say, but my condo is different. Of course. They I'm do. on a better street. I'm in a better neighborhood. You don't understand. I put a million dollars into my condo. You can't reduce me to a bunch of numbers on your spreadsheet. Correct. But, you know, that, and there's always... And there's always sellers like that. And there's, and you know, that's just part of the fabric of this market, the, the, the net of this market. And there, that'll never, that'll certainly never change. There's always gonna be aspirational sellers. There's always gonna be sellers that have a, a price in their mind that they're just not gonna be willing to sell at until they get it. Um, you know, I, I think if you break down inventory to uh, what's fresh and what's not fresh, you know, you're gonna see some interesting things about that inventory, which will probably I, I don't mean sellers. to be contrarian, but there's a few people probably here who say, if I take your conclusion to the end degree, then Zillow is right. Then real estate is really just about the data. And I just, if I have perfect data, I have a perfect view under the real estate, then I could be in the eye buying market. And we saw how that worked out. No, it's terrible. Uh, yeah. But there's a big emotion. There's a human component to real estate that's not that is it captured in your data and oh that's that's 100 percent true that there's and especially in in new york city especially in new york city when you go from one every building in manhattan is its own marketplace yeah so if you think about the fact that we got it's like whoa so like if you show a chelsea two bedroom two bed uh, two bath co-op market snapshot that's great it may have nothing to do with the building that's in that sector that you're trying to price you know everything may be completely different because of the the nuances of the market and then you add in the nuances of the of the of the personal situation that the buyers and sellers are going through. Um, I mean, I, I know what these guys deal with. It's not easy. It's a hard, hard shark eat shark type of market. And especially when there's low inventory and there's a lot of demand, that's an especially tough. So market. even if I reduce this to a couple, a very small neighborhood and a small tight group of buildings in Chelsea, and I'm just studying two bedroom apartments in Chelsea, uh, I still have to uh, re remember that this isn't IBM. This is not like we're set, we're trading IBM and Apple stock here, that these are individual apartments and that there's a lot we don't know about why this sold for this price per foot and why that sold for that price per foot, why this took a hundred days and why this took a thousand days. Yeah. Yeah, and that's always that's that's one of the, the the mysteries of this market that will always be there. You know, I think I think what agents are learning um, through data um, is is and, and Zillow had a totally different approach, which was not, which in my opinion was not broker friendly. But I think agents are learning through data that you could um, expedite transactions and you can help buyers or sellers make difficult decisions that they truly want to make, but they're too stubborn to to see it. Um, and, and there's certain strategies and certain ways of turning data into a conversation and taking that message. It's very hard, quite frankly. And, 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 you know, me and John are constantly talking about this because this is kind of how we're trying to create or we're trying to make urban digs almost like the national keeping current matters. I don't know if you heard that company keeping current matters, but that's what we're trying to do with urban digs, um, and, and become, turn data into a very, very clean message that could be trusted, you know, in a neutral a neutral way, this trusted, neutral, unbiased type of way. And it's it's very difficult to have these types of conversations to tell a seller to lower their price and to tell a buyer to raise their bid. You I know can what I'm tell saying? you from Connecticut's yeah. point of view, and I speak for everybody in Connecticut when I say this, we're jealous. We wish we had, <laughs> we wish we had these tools to help facilitate the conversations we're having. 
the way we do it in Connecticut is a little bit the old fashioned way where you call a bunch of people and you say, so what did, what have you seen? How many people showed up at your open house? And that's how yeah. we, we gauge the market pulse because still, we don't have this data set. But that still happens here, John. We're just, this is uh, that data is like, it's like an ocean, you know, as it rises, it's a general marker, but then they allow you on the platform to really curate what you need to find out. But in addition, do you remember remember the guy from Yale that we had on, the doctor, Robert, or whatever? And he said, you know, a small sample is not great. But if your sample is also way too big, it's not giving you any information. So you have to curate down into those this, this micro neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. And then, then the phone calls come in. It's all about, you know, a lot of brokers say, like, well, I don't need to know other brokers. This is where you get all your information, right? You know, hey, how did, how's this going? How's it going? How close are you to that asking price? How many people did you have come? All those types of things. You have all of that is just texturing on top of the information that you're providing for your for your clients, right? It's the same thing as you. So we yeah. do it. I mean, this is a gem. What they have is it's a pot of gold because we. I mean, I look at things one way and then I look at it another way and then I say, you know, they're going to tell me, they're going to rebut me with this and then I'm gonna, I need to look at it and I mean, I triangulate it from every single angle so that I know what I'm talking about. Right. And that's the experience of a broker that you learn, right? You have to go, you can be a broker and go through a hundred deals and still see something weird situation you've never seen before. Um, and, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, transparency is good, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's like the goal of urban digs was to just help buyers and sellers make decisions that uh, smarter, quicker decisions, because I, we think that they want to sell or that they want to buy, but they don't understand the market. You know, and it's the craziest thing, because I, I think the most important thing right now that brokers need to understand, um, and this is hard for me to convey this, is that they need to become their own trusted con conveyor of information to their network, right? They need their network to cling to them, to give them the gateway of this information, um, because there's a lot of money on the table. For example, think about, like, all right, what do buyers really want? Like, we ever asked this kind of question? Like, if you think about, yes, buyers, like, what do you want? Like, what type of market do you want to buy in? They're going to say something like, I want a lot of inventory, right? I want, I want to have options. I want to have negotiability. I would love to get discounts if possible, right? And, you know, I just want to make sure I get a really good deal. That's what they That's think like, they want. They think they, they want that. What I, they I really mean, want <laughs> is a more balanced market. Because when you say, what do you really, do you really want to get a great deal? Then they come back and say, well, I do want to be able to sell it, <laughs> you know, yes. when I'm done. Yeah, but, but think about this now, right? So now put yourself back into time and place to, to COVID. It's, it's such a great case study to, like, to, to prove the strategy of what we're saying here, right? Back in, in, during COVID, no one bought. Deal volume went straight down, right? Why? Because buyers were uncertain. Buyers were scared. Buyers were afraid of catching a falling knife, something like that. But we had the data to show exactly how prices were falling and exactly how the market was falling and exactly when prices were coming back and when the market was coming back. And every single signal that we had was flashing in, in July, August, September, October, November, December of 2020. Like it wasn't like two months, it was month after month after month. And yet nobody bought, why? Like, I always like to understand the psychology. And the only thing I could come up with is that these buyers have no clue what the hell is going on. Like, they don't, nobody's telling them, nobody's showing them the market get hit. Nobody's showing them the market start to normalize. Nobody's showing them the market coming back over that sequence of time of six months. Instead, they're getting nothing. And then a buyer or, or a broker will come back to them, I'm sorry, broker will say, hey, market's recovering, go buy. And they don't make a decision. And we're wondering why. Well, what if you showed them? What if you showed them? What if you like provided, like imagine a plane in a storm, right? And you lose your instrumentation and you can't see in a cloudy storm. Give them, this is like giving them the instrumentation. So at least they could see a little bit of where they're going and maybe they'll have confidence to make a decision that they otherwise would not have made because they see it. That's the logic of what I'm trying to, trying to figure out. But the, so what that requires, no, that requires the broker to not be short thinking because a lot of brokers yeah. just want to get the deal done as opposed yes. to investing in the relationship and doing and, and saying, look, we're going to get this done and we're going to do it right. 
and you, you know, we're going to take this path. We got to be patient here. You know, that's not the right time to, you know, you can't make an offer on that right now or whatever the case may be. And being able yeah. to invest in that because, and that's who you, that's who you want as a broker because they'll trust you. Yeah. And, and, and I would even like, what I would say is like, um, yeah, I, I don't even go into like bidding and not bidding. That's not, I, I would just be like the purveyor of, oh, listen, the, the Urban Digs market pulse is at 0.85. We were down. Next one is 6.5, 5.5, 4.5, 3.5, 25. And then all of a sudden it starts coming back. You don't even have to mention bidding. You could just keep it high level and, and be like, guys, uh, uh, there could be a peak opportunity soon. It's not yet, but it's coming. And you separate that to your buyers. See, this is what's interesting. I think buyer, uh, agents are entering a new age an era of social media, an era of marketing, an era of technology, Zoom, all these things that brokers now, that's like, shit, I got to go do this stuff. Like, you know how many old timers are like, Ugh, like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. There's so much stuff. Like this whole Zoom thing, you know, it's a lot. But like in this day and age, you kind of, you have to have a network. You have to have a way to send messages to sellers specifically separate than your buyers. So you have to tag your network. And there's a lot of People that are not doing this, but the people that are the agents that are doing this and they're growing their network and they're sending messages this way and they're sending messages that way and it's not commingled, those, those buyers and those sellers are clinging to them. And what's happening is guys like Roberto, he's now credible. He's trusted. He doesn't have to earn his credibility. He's already gained it over the fact that he's doing this on a consistent basis and giving out Quite frankly, it's just the information. It's just, it's unbiased, not twisted, just reporting what it is flat out, right? So that we can see which way it's going. And we're acknowledging that sometimes there's going to be peak opportunities for sellers and sometimes there'll be peak opportunities for buyers. And you know what? Everyone's interacting and transacting in between all these levels. That buyer, trust me, he wants to buy, he's going to buy. So Even if you say, wait. So as an agent, I can, for my client who's looking on the Upper West Side of Manhattan at the three to $4 million level, can I license from you a search that's very specific that goes directly to him? What tools do you provide? I mean, we've seen the website and I can go and I can search, I can create a search, but then can I white label that and send it to my client? Right. So I, I don't think about it as, as license. I think about it as collaboration um, kind of a thing. And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, you do create a, a, there's a profile, you say who, what firm you're with and everything is branded. And then when you do a search and you save a search, it's, we have a whole collaboration system um, that works on your phone as well. And you can save searches and you can choose to share and collaborate or just save it for yourself and you get updates and you get alerts and it's be branded to you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, but it's I, a have nice to, tool. I have to get the data, write my, my uh, you know, say, you know, this is what I found and send it to them. There is no automated process. There's no, no it's, all, it's, it's completely it automated. automated. You, you could choose to do it whatever way you want. You could do okay. it not automated. You could just go there and search. You could save the search for yourself and then select listings to send individually, or you could automate it and, and share, share the, oh, excuse me, and share the uh, search with your client and they're going to get all the updates. Got it. Yeah. Well, every day, every day. It One of the things I'm learning about this business is for, we are a, an industry of optimists. Uh, every week, somebody comes on this show and they say, what do they say, Roberto? New York is back, baby. New York is back. COVID is over. Broadway is open. Yankee Stadium is open. It is just getting better every day. And if you pull most of the agents on this call, they're going to say, I'm doing better this year than I was doing last year. They yeah. all, we are an industry of optimists. And yeah. you want me to rain on that parade? What do you want me to do? <laughs> That's <laughs> factual. That's factual. I, I want to know from a data guy who's not blowing sunshine. Is New York I'm not back? blowing sunshine. Is New York back? Um, yeah. I mean, well, well, here's, okay, here's the way I look at it. First off, we are in a, in a quickly rising price action market, almost similar to what happened with the mansion tax in mid-2019, where we pulled forward all those big deals. And for three or four months, we had a lot big, and then we went down. The luxury sector in Manhattan is doing some nice things. It's been doing nice things. It's pushing, it's booing all these things. And plus, let's be honest, buyers are not going after studios. Okay. They're not going up to studios. They're going up to the higher price, bigger stuff. So generally speaking, larger apartments. So we're starting to see that price action rise and you're in it right now. So you're going to see price action rise. Now, here's the thing. Is when I look at the quality, can you see that in your charts? No, that I can't, I can't really see that. Um, I imagine it is. 
I don't think buyers are paying up for, for just basic stuff, but I don't know. But, but here's the thing. So when it comes to price action, okay, when it comes to price action, we're probably back at like early 2019, late 2018 levels and rising, meaning we, we had COVID in 2020, we fell, we recovered. For the most part, we recovered. Maybe the, the luxury sector, the super luxury sector, maybe they still have a little bit to go before they fully recover, but the broader market has recovered and we're heading higher. So we're probably somewhere in 2019 headed towards 2018. But the pulse of the market, the inventory and the deal volume, right? The contract activity and the supply is back at levels at like 2015. So the peak of the market was 2015. But the bid, right? It's all about the bid. The bid for the market is 2019 and rising, right? And it's being buoyed temporarily by luxury that ultimately will fade out. So you're going to have three, four, five months of really good numbers, and then it's going to come down, right? Now, here's the thing. Manhattan real estate. It's, there's reasons why the bid is only at 2019. There's some deflationary forces still impacting this market. This market is not fully in the clear. However, we're doing some good stuff. The rental market's starting to come back. The sales market has recovered nicely. Um, we're starting to get, uh, the mandates are starting to get faded out. Now here's the problem. Commercial markets still got problems. The foreign buyers are not there. The foreign investors are not there. The, the ground floor, real, the ground floor uh, commercial sector is still not there. The students are not there. The tourists are not there. So the way I conceptualize this is the recovery that you've seen in Manhattan. All right, this is one prong to it. The recovery that you've seen in Manhattan is a local domestic-based recovery. It is not a full capacity recovery, meaning that we don't have the depth, the tentacles of the buyer pool are, are cut in half until we get all those foreigners and the students and the business and the investors and the commercial and the ground floor. Then you're going to be operating at full capacity. When's that going to happen? Not for years. Like, no, not for years. This is going to be a multi-year thing. And what's going to happen is Oh, one thing will go online now, and then next year another will go online, and then next year you realize another is online, and you'll be at 24, 25 before you, you kind of realize it, get, it gets normal. By then, you're in a secular, secular up, uptrend, a bull trend for Manhattan real estate. So this is the way I look at it. Manhattan real estate did not do what other dense vertical markets or national markets did. Those markets are up 30, 40% in the last three, four years. And now they're going to correct. This market is barely even and we're just making up for it right now. So there's a relative value. And I think that it's just going to slowly go up in a channel with little waves in between of up and down. We're in an up wave. We're in an up wave right now. But it's going to go up in a channel, secular bull run for the next four or five years, similar to 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. And anyone that was doing business in 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, know that was defined by a low inventory, high demand, rising price action market. That's what I think. Where uh, will inventory be in a sense? Because we're, we're really kind of compressed right now. Do you think yeah, we're going to see a lot by 25? So we're, we're low, right? We're low right now. And everyone knows that we're low. I, I think we're probably around six, 61, 6,200 6, units. Something like we're that. Not, we're, let me ask you, we're not, not very low, super low. We're just no. super high demand. Yeah. The, the, for, the, for the, that. The, as John was saying, the absorption, if you look at absorption, like how much listings are coming on versus how many listings are in contract, like net inventory, we are, we're not growing. Like there's more stuff going in contract and off market than there is coming on. So like supply just has nowhere to go. But when you look at supply in the absolute terms of 6,200, yeah, we're not, we're not at, we're not at 3,500 or 3,000 like we were in 2014. Um, but you gotta be aware of, you gotta be aware of where you are, like, like situation, like look what's going on around us right now. Right. Well, that's where I wanted to go. I mean, you could have <laughs> said you could have given the macroeconomic view a month ago, but now we've got new new headwinds. We've got the war. We've got the energy prices. We have a lot of new factors in the last. Have you seen those headwinds reflected in your charts? No, no. It's 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 too soon to tell because because the real volatility was only in the last few weeks, and in Manhattan real estate. If, if deals are going to, um, the, the contracts that are being signed coming in the data now is, is from days or weeks ago, assuming the brokers 
updating in a timely manner. It's in a perfect world, you know, Roberto gets his check, gets the keys, goes home, updates the system to contract signed, you know, but that doesn't happen like that all the time. You know what I'm saying? But that deal is done. And that was, that was weeks in advance. The deals that we really are, are questioning right now is all those negotiations and contracts that are out right now. Is there anything that's pausing that? And is that going to cause the front end of the pipe deal volume that's punching out all this deal volume to start to go down? So far, when I look at my ticker, I do not see it, but it's too early because the real volatility has only been in the last couple of weeks. Even though you're right, the macro signs were growing. Credit spreads have been rising since January for anyone that follows credit spreads. Okay. I got credit spread alert on Twitter. I do a daily thing. That's me. Um, it's a great thing to follow. Credit spreads have been rising since January. That means that, that we could be entering risk off. And if you look at what the market's been doing for the last two weeks, we've been quite volatile and risk off. So now we have this, this war and you have inflation. And personally, I don't want to, th this is not for, this is not for you guys to, tell your age, uh, clients of, but I, I worry whether or not this is going to be like a weaponization of money and resources. And you're starting to see it like food, inflation, you know, Scott other, Hobbs, other you're, metals. You're nodding. Why are you nodding? You like Scott Hobbs next to you has a 200 person business and he's building 10, he's renovating $10 million apartments in the city and $10 million houses out here. Scott, are you betting on his optimism? Well, I, I, no, I like the optimism. I do also have the worry that he does that as, I mean, the United States has always been a safe legal haven that if you can get money here and if you buy your New York City apartment, you're going to get to keep your New York City apartment. Right now, with if you're a Russian oligarch who legally bought your apartment with legal money, no matter how you acquired it, you know, people are taking it away from you. So what does that do to other people who are looking and saying, look, I want to buy in this market because it's a safe asset. And is it going to remain a safe asset? So that, that's one of the sort of side unintended consequences of what of how our leaders are acting right now about changing the whole legal structure of who's entitled to what. As New York was disproportionately affected by COVID, as you said, the rest of the country enjoyed a 30 percent uptick. New York hasn't. It was disproportionately affected by COVID. I could argue that it's going to be disproportionately affected by disruptions in the new world order, by a war, the weaponization of money, uh, hits to Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, is that what you're worried about? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's on the table. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not betting on it, but it's, that's, that's definitely on the table and it's definitely a macro uncertainty. And I think that's one reason why there's, there's, um, volatility and, and, and uh, all the other stuff is going to credit spread. All the other signals are, are flashing, but um, I haven't seen it yet in the market. And, and that's the thing. It's like, I'm, I'm going to see it. Like we'll see deal volume just fall. It happens every single time. We will see deal volume fall um, on a weekly basis and on a monthly basis. And we're going to know that the bid is now dropping. Right. And if, if it's, if it's going to happen, it should start happening soon. Like we should start seeing, it's been a couple of weeks already. Like if, it, if, if buyers are stepping back, it should happen. But what Scott said is a very, a very, you know, real uncertainty, unintended consequences is a very good way of putting it. Um, and I'm sure there's other unintended consequences to all the fiscal and monetary things that have happened over the last couple of years. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're heading into that. So, but, but again, like when you look at where you're going to, where are you going to put your money? Like, I mean, there's the Fed created this search for yield. You have to understand where we're generally in a deflationary environment, right? We're in a deflationary environment and, and the credit markets start to get crazy unsettled in, in 2020. And the, the Fed just, they just learned from Lehman. Like, don't underestimate what they did. They kind of had to do what they do. We're criticizing them now, but like, if, you know, what's your choice? If you let the credit markets roll over and get disrupted, you, you don't want that. Like we saw that with Lehman. And with Lehman, they were late. Whether you knew it or not, they were late. They had all these programs. It took them seven, six months, seven months to figure it all out. They had a playbook. And with this crisis, they went all in on that playbook and they contained it to their credit. The problem is, is they, that they, didn't, they didn't pull it back. They didn't pull it back. They, they had plenty of opportunity to pull this back and rein it in, but we don't have the political will to rein it in and pull it back because you know, of, of whatever it's going to be. And, and here we are, and now here we are, and we got war and we have inflation and I don't know, I mean, the Fed's gonna have to hike rates. So let me ask you something about, you know, 
the apartments that need work and everything need a lot of renovation and, and I would imagine new construction for Scott. Yeah. Um, at least here, it there was like a 30% spread of value, but it yeah. was just starting to, it was starting to slightly narrow, but because of what's going on, it has to widen I, again. I think it's widening. And it's so, I just was, was on a uh, demo with an agent that was looking at a studio that was on like the 26th floor. It was at a very good price. And it was totally, it was a wreck. It was a wreck and it's not selling. And I looked at all the comps and it's like, it, this should be $40,000 higher. And we looked at the renovation adjustment. We're like, I ah, will subtract a hundred grand. And we're like, we're way off. It's not even, that hundred grand is not even close, you know, because of what's going on. I think buyers, I think buyers are really stepping away from smaller and especially unrenovated apartments right now because of the, the perceived costs and the headaches of what it's going to be, let alone what it's going to be. We always know that it's going to be more. Yeah. <laughs> it's always more. It's never yeah, yeah. less. Yeah, you know? it's, never, it's never but, less. But their perceived idea of what it's going to cost, what they sit down with their husband, their wife and go over the numbers like, all right, we this, 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 and we add it all up at the calculator. It's like, it's going to be, it's way high. And so they're not making decisions or they're even valuing renovated even more for whatever reason. You know, I, I was talking to Deanna Corey on this podcast I did yesterday and, and we talked about this and we're talking about staging unrenovated apartments, et cetera. And I was wondering, is there an arbitrage play? Because unrenovated units are getting substantially discounted right now, especially smaller ones. Smaller unrenovated because they're smaller stu studio studio unrenovated units is like a gold mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even kidding. And you and you don't do anything to them. You hold it and you just deal with it, whatever you. And then three years from now, hopefully, I mean, this could last a little while, but hopefully, this has a, you know, usually these parabolic moves have a bad ending. You know what I'm but saying? The, melt up, melt down. So the tough thing about the studio is, is that's a lower budget, right? And those people yeah. tend to not have the wherewithal to put any additional money into it. On the other scale, you know, right. you go up the scale, these are people with all kinds of cash. It's a matter of, do they want to deal with the hassle? Because yeah. a big gut renovation on an apartment that's 4,000 square feet is like two years now. That's the trade-off. And that's, and that's the thing. That, so like, if you're in a unique position where you can get that classic six or seven or whatever it is, that's unrenovated and it's being substantially discounted because no one wants to deal with it. And then you could somehow live with it until you can until this makes sense again. And now it's not going to cost you all that. It's going to cost you much less and you can do it in less time. You, again, there might be an arbitrage play there. Scott, have you made adjustments to, to like pricing and bidding for projects just in the last couple of weeks? Well, a lot of our work, well, it becomes, it becomes fixed price, but you see the prices literally, you know, what we get from our vendors are good for 30 days. And it used to be 30 days, which, well, you'd extend it out to six months. Now 30 days means 30 days. And some of the guys are like 10 or 15 days. I mean, it just, the prices can change like that as their supply chain changes below them. So it, it's a very fluid market and it's a tight market. I mean, the good people are employed. You, know, you can always find some hack and, and get them to do something, but to get people who are responsible and, and know what they're doing, that's tricky. And working in New York City is very hard. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to find parking. It's hard to get guys to jobs. It's hard to get materials there. You're only allowed to work from, you know, 830 until four o'clock and you're out the building. You can't do weekends, can't do holidays. And if you go too long, you're out. So it, it, it's tricky. And penalized, right? Penalized. Penalties start kicking in. And then there's the doorman. But no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, all those things. And, 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 and so many people don't understand that. What's involved? So can we talk about some of your data, where you generate some of your data? Because I'm just curious, because I, I, I'm on your scale of, of inventory, right around six grand or 6,100, whatever the case may be. Yeah. But like, I look at, for example, I see something put out by Jonathan Miller or by Shlomi or something, and it's, it's literally a different scale. It's like, maybe they yeah. have 6,900. Like, where is the disparity there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to update this. So, so the way Urban Digs used to work, if you go to the chart room in Urban Digs, it says 5470, right? Those are, those are excluding stale listings, right? Um, I, know, I know once upon a time, the industry had a update rule and you had to update listings every 14 days or whatever it is, right? That rule is not, not there anymore. 
um, it, it, it faded. I, I don't know exactly when it faded. I think it was very recent, but um, in the last few months, I'm thinking it was. And um, there's a lot of listings that are not updated. And so if you go to my search, you're going to see all the listings, which is around 6,200. Um, so, so we use the RLS for that, for, for just the active, but my chart used to exclude all the sale. There's some listings that are not updated in 180 days, 200 right. days, 300 days. I mean, you know, they're probably not active, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think we're going to have to change things now that, that things are changing in the industry. Um, but you're going to, we did a lot of, um, <laughs> we did a lot of things to the data, um, status flow, algos, um, duplicates, um, other things, um, you know, Eric's, Eric Gordon's on this channel. He, he's sitting there laughing. He knows what I'm talking about. Um, he's not going to, I don't think he's going to show up, Eric. I'm giving you something. Right? He's a fellow Jets fan, so I love Eric. Um, but there's a lot of things with the data that you have to fix the data. And, and I see why one place will see it differently based on the level of standard, standardization, normalization, <laughs> Steve, standardization, normalization, um, all that other stuff and the integrity issues and, and all the things you have to do to make the data as, as accurate as possible. Um, there's little nuances. It's not a perfect world in the data, in the New York City data industry, especially on the sales side. You know, Acris has its own, um, Acris is our sales um, source and that has its own set of problems. Um, and it's an ongoing, ongoing thing. And merging the two, that's very difficult, you know, because everything has to match up. And in, in our world, it doesn't. And you also talk to me because I'm always mystified by the number, the quantity of apartments that are actually coming off the market. Is that just an exclusive expired and turned over? Someone's just decided not to sell? Like, I'm just, you know, we have a huge growth of, we have a great week of listings coming on, but the overall inventory just contracts. Like where, yeah. I'm it's, mystified it's, by that. It's the net, it's the net. You have to think about all this as um, what is inventory, right? Active inventory is all the listings that are active in RLS, technically speaking, right? So that's that's our, and, and Brooklyn MLS, and Brooklyn MLS, both those. Um, and then how does it change? Well, stuff is always falling out of it, right? Maybe something closed. Maybe maybe you have an ACRIS filing that came in, but the broker never changed it, the contract signed. So now it has to come out of active. It never went to the contract signed step. It got flipped, right? But then you got 1,500, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you got, you got uh, 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 a couple of hundred listings coming on today. So you have 200 listings coming on today and you have 150 listings that are active that go into contract. And then you got 50 listings that are active that go off the market. And then you got 10 listings that are active that closed. And you got five listings that expired. So you got to take all these things into account and look at the net. And when you think about the net, right, that chart's actually coming. Um, resupply is the closest thing to it, but that doesn't in in incorporate off market. So that's not it. That's going to become net. And that'll be there in a few weeks or something. And the, the net, if you look at the net, it's red. It's red. So it's, it's, it's down. It's, it's, there's a negative force on supply. So even though supply is rising relative to where it is, it's got this weight on it. That's how you look at that. And the only way that changes is if the net goes green. And the last time that happened was during COVID. And then ever since then, it happened for like four months. It was like, I think it was like April, May, June, July of 2020. And then ever since then, uh, we've been, we have been down. Yeah, that's not going to show it to you. It'll be different. But that's, um, a sim that's basically looking at um, new listings minus contract sign. It just doesn't incorporate off market. You know, we're about to enter the this big listing season, but I'm just curious because a lot of things tend to come on late January. They start to populate February. Do you recall, I haven't looked at it myself, but that March has a little bit of a lull because there's spring breaks and stuff like that. And then April hits. No, no. What I see in the data is, is, April and September are the two peaks of, of listing waves. I think of it as waves, right? There's waves. Yeah. So like um, February is a, is a little wave. Yeah. March is a, bit, is a bigger wave. April is the biggest wave. And then it goes down, yeah. right? So if you look at the, the two peak waves, April and September are going to be your two peak listing period wave. So we are, we're in it, um, which is worrisome. But is there something going on? This is what makes this so interesting. I, 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 when I look at the credit spread, again, I look, I'm sorry to go outside, but when I look at the 10 year treasury yield yeah. and I look at what the Fed's about to do, all right, let's, let's just not mess around for a second and let's just tell you what the Fed's going to do. Okay. Number one, they're going to stop buying. They're still buying. 
they're still buying. So they're going to stop buying. Number two, they're going to raise the Fed funds rate. Number three, they're going to sell their balance sheet. You understand that? They're going to tighten their balance. They're going to pull it. They're almost going to orchestrate or try to orchestrate a mini bubble collapse kind of a thing, you know, to control inflation. And, and they're trapped. Like they don't have a choice. So this is going to, this, this is, this is going to happen. I don't think a lot of people, so now everything's flashing in macro land, in my opinion, because of where we came from. Like most of the times, 10 year treasuries would fall in risk off, in risk off money goes to treasuries and dollars. Okay. Money goes to treasuries and dollars. Money is not going to treasuries right now. Treasury yields are rising. So if you think about what credit spreads are rising, well, treasury yields are rising. Oh my God, credit spread, corporate yields must be rising much faster than the treasury. And that's the answer. It's like, oh, that's a little upsetting. So we have to talk about the potential that maybe something is going on that we have to look out for Manhattan real estate that was not there before. I mean, we saw signs of it before, but we're at a different place now. Like, let's face it, a month ago, it's a little different than today. So like, I, I'm trying to figure out how I want to present this to the audience. I haven't, I haven't, like my, my, my viewers have not talked about this. John and I are, are briefly mentioning it here and there, but so we Merrill haven't done Lynch, a whole piece of this. Merrill Lynch put out a 40 minute uh, discussion yesterday, a podcast yesterday, Scott and I watched it. The first 20 minutes was an expert. And then there was a, 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 a panel talking about what he just told us. Uh, one of the takeaways was they said, how is this like, uh, are we going into a recession? And they said, energy prices were at their peak in 2008. It's not enough for energy prices to spike and they see inflation and spike. It's not enough. You, we, we're going to need a second event. That second event was Lehman Brothers and the, and, the, and the credit markets in 2008, combined with high energy prices, was enough to put us into a recession. So they said, you've got one of the two factors. We don't know. We don't think that the second shoe is going to fall, but it may. And so I guess if you had a return of COVID or you had uh, enough, I guess, um, or the war got worse, it could be enough along with high energy prices to put yeah, us and, in recession. And I don't even, you know, and I, I don't even... Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the recession, I, 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 that I just don't know. Um, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. Um, it's one of those things that usually we realize it later on and then they label it kind of a thing. And by then you're out of it. Um, I just, I, I don't see COVID as being um, the, the, the thing that is hurting the bids right now. Um, I agree. I think, but isn't it the uncertainty yeah. that's causing people not to list? It's constraining supply. You know, um, in New York City, yeah, I think so because because I think where they're going to go, right? And I was going to ask you in Connecticut. You're probably seeing this more in Connecticut. And I spoke to my buddy in Boston who works for a big team in Boston. He's like, I, I, I can't. He's like, I'm like, don't you have sellers that you can tell that there's such a great market? He's like, I tell them every week. He's like, they all come back to me saying, I would love to sell. I got no place to go. And right. that's my, the thing. My, my Connecticut sellers at five million dollars. Finally, they could sell their house for five million dollars. They look at Florida, right? Because they've already educated their kids, maybe in the Connecticut schools, and they're now ready for the Florida phase of their life. They said yeah. Palm Beach, Palm Beach, all the way down to Waterdale is untouchable. You know, they wow. said to replace my five million dollar Connecticut house or my five million dollar New York apartment. It's going to cost me eight to ten million dollars in Florida. Yeah, and and that's one reason why you have to wonder: is is housing going to have a bust after what it's been through? And I you always ask yourself that after a bubble, you know, a, a, a monetary uh, uh, central bank fueled, you know, chase for yield, we're going to call it. Um, and I look at the housing market, and I think, yeah, I think I think they're going to cool off. They're going to come down. They're probably in the process of doing it now. Um, but there's not a lot of inventory. That's number one. Um, interest rates are going up. They're going up, but they're still like, I mean, what'd they do? Three and a half to four. You know what still I'm saying? Cheap. Still cheap. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, I when I bought my place, it was it was 2001. Uh, I was at a I was at a trading desk at Tradescape, you know, 499 Park. And I think I got a seven and a half percent interest rate. And I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited at a seven and a half. I was like, yes, it's not eight, it doesn't have an eight handle on it. I'm like, I beat the system, you know, so excited. Um, so I don't think three and a half to four percent is gonna hurt it. I mean, if we start going to five percent, that may be. Um, but you look at the housing market and bank banks are being prudent, man. Banks are not being stupid. They're not, they're not lending to just anybody. 
So I don't see a credit crisis, a, a mortgage crisis, credit crisis that I think it's going to be different. I don't know. So I think housing is always going to be like an inflation hedge. Um, and I think we're kind of going to go into this period of, of, of higher than normal inflation. Everyone's wondering if it's transitory. I just, I, 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 I don't see it. I mean, I don't see it. I don't see what, how this is, this whole war doesn't help anything. And you're so seeing it with, yeah. So, so the average one of us, the way we see this in the market is you're going to see interest rates go up into the area of four, right? But certainly not to five or six or seven, but they're going to go up moderately. And that's not going to profoundly affect our market. And inflation is going to occur. And it's not going to profoundly affect our market, right? We expect we're not going to be in the 1%. Infl we're now at 7% inflation, but you don't see it profoundly affecting the Manhattan market. So supply chain, you see that getting better, not worse. Yes. Uh, COVID I mean, with, getting with better. San with sanctions and everything that's going to go on, who knows what's going to, I mean, people, people are going into commodity protection mode. Governments are going into commodity and resources protection. The mode. supply chain could continue to be a problem. COVID, you think we're seeing the worst. Yes. We've got to get better, not worse. Yes. Um, I, so I think I think we're still in some period of uncertainty for, for New York City. But I think I think that the fact that it did its unique thing and that you you but I look at price action, I realize I got to look at the last four or five months. That's going to power price action. And when I look at the last four or five months, that's that's not going to be the negative. That's going to be powered up. Um, what worries me is what's happening right now that I'm not going to see that that price data for for four or five months because I got to wait for that to close. And then I got to wait for actors to file it. So I got to wait three, four or five months to get that data. I'm wondering if we're seeing it now. And the only way I could see it now is through listing flow. And I'm not seeing it. I mean, we're still doing 300 contracts a week which is incredible for this market. So I don't know what's going on. Um, I think the brokers could probably speak better to that if, if the buyers are backing out or if they're having caution, you know, they'll see it first. We're so, in yeah. year two of no listings in Connecticut. I don't see that getting better. The bottom right. line is the baby boomers aren't going to list their house as fast as the millennials want to buy them. And that's, in, that's true everywhere. We're yeah. Five million houses short. Shortages, yeah. Boston's two million. Scott Hobbs and his buddies in the building business don't get on it. it we're, we're gonna. It's gonna be a problem for them. Well, well, how, but but how are they gonna see now? That's the thing. I mean, does it? Is it maybe Scott? Is it feasible? Is it economically? Fe look, look what he was. The uncertainty that he has with his labor force, with with the services, with the with the um, materials. That's the thing. And if you go into that psychology now, it's like I, now you think about how real this is becoming. And now we got, again, you got commodity and resource protection. This is like just beginning. Like, I don't think we're Scott, understanding. Is labor what's harming? You're not able to get any land. You're able to get labor and you're able to get credit from the banks, but you don't have any projects that you could buy. But you, I mean, you end up, as it, it, I was pointing out here, I mean, it's like, look, in, in high demand areas, land is, is scarce and expensive. Therefore, in order to build on it, you can really only build toward the high end of the market. And so as, as is typical- But Noah said that that part, end of the market is doing just fine. He said there's going to be plenty of demand at the high end. But that it'll, it, it'll moderate, but it'll moderate. It could be moderating now for all I know. So go on, Scott. You're going to build a high end stuff because it's there. There can't be a new supply because again, the costs that go into stuff and, and the costs have gone up a lot because of regulatory issues. I mean, what it costs to get approvals is unbelievable. And then also you have different things where uh, fire safety. I mean, there's a fire safety lobby and who doesn't like fire safety? But what's required on a lot of things these days is ridiculous because some people make money on it. And meanwhile, the fire inspectors vote on it. And of course, they're all dedicated toward fire safety. So everyone pays an extra two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 for fire safety that didn't exist five years ago. And we didn't have a whole ton of people dying. And same with structure and same with other sort of things that just keep raising the cost, which makes it so much harder to go ahead and satisfy the lower, the moderate and lower end of the market. So even if you can find the labor and even if you, if the credit is there and the interest rates are low, you can't identify, you as a typical builder cannot identify affordable projects that you can make, make money on. Not, not in high value areas. I mean, if you go way outside, if you go into the, the more distressed areas, then you can do that. 
but of course that involves more risk and it takes more more guts to do it and then you know you also have to get governance to come along to make people come in and i mean i'm sure no one can point out places in new york city where some places are great and a couple other places really are kind of straight line but yeah and but eventually the straight line will go up because high prices solve issues and low prices solve issues Noah, is the top moving just because that's where the inventory is? Because below, you know, on the, the lower you come down the scale where the overwhelming amount of the populace is, there's very little and there's a lot more competition for that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Um, yeah, I did a podcast with Deanna and she said everything is moving like crazy, except it was easier to her to say it this way, except the eight to ten million dollar sector and the studio sector. Those are the only two sectors. Like the eight to ten million is that weird. So, yeah, it's like no man's land a little bit. That's what we called it. It's like a no man's land. You're not in the you know kind of you're luxury not, sector. You're not in a super luxury sector. You're, you're not trying. making that six or seven million just happen, or you yeah. just buying Mac Daddy place. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to squeeze something that's not there, you know, out of it. You know, it's like you got the empty bottle of bourbon. And you're just squeezing the glass, trying to get the last drips out of it, you know. As the that. guy walks by with a case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, and I, I mean, it was telling to hear her, like she, she was on cloud nine. She's like, ah, I can't believe how crazy this market is. And she's like, if something is happening, she's like, if something is happening with macro and all the things that are going on with the war, I'm not seeing it yet. Now that was recorded about a week and a half ago, but it's still pretty timely. I mean, the market has deteriorated a little bit in a week and a half, but um. It's still timely. And again, unless something is happening now, and we have to say this, we have to say that normally I would not say this, but now you're getting some things that are flashing some things. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy with credit spreads. I just am. So, and that, until that goes down, I'm not happy. Like, and I don't, I don't like it widening out. I don't like that. So I don't want to see that, you know, um, but so we, should real go watch, we should go listen to talking Manhattan with Deanna Corey. Yeah, we just posted Deanna Corey, the one, yep. the one today. I got it up um, on the screen now, and then you had Ryan Serhant before that. Yeah, and that's that's and that was it. Those are the last. We just bring it back. We had a year and a half hiatus. Oh. We didn't have time. Me and John were were way too busy with other developmental things. But uh, we just brought it back with Ryan uh, last month. We're gonna do it once a month. We got Deanna on, and um, we'll keep it going. So, what have you learned on these uh, on these podcasts? Talk to talk to us about podcasts. Tell Roberto and I, uh, you know, your secrets. Nah, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing just great. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any secrets. I just, I just like to just have someone on that tells it like it is. That's all. That's all I care about. What did you learn from Ryan? Ryan's, uh, Ryan's reinvented himself. I mean, you know, yeah. wow. Yeah, he's, in, he's doing incredible things. He started his own company. He's got like 150 agents now, which is incredible. Um, you know, a couple of takeaways with Ryan, he was talking more about um, the marketing side and, 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 and some stories, but the main thing is he, he thinks we're going to be in a 2012 to 2014 environment, um, which, which is a low inventory, high demand, gradually rising price action environment, which I totally agree with. Totally um, I think agree that was, with that. that was the biggest, yeah. And, and, and nothing goes up in a straight line. Like you're going to have, if you're in a rising channel, you're going to have ups and downs and up and down inside that channel. I think people try to time it you know, and they start to think about that. It's like, no, we are in a seasonal marketplace. We have lulls. You have a stock market that goes down a few months. We have lulls there. And if you happen to be selling at a period of time here versus there, like right now we're in an up wave and it's probably going to get faded out, but we're in an up wave right now. So. so, but what you're talking about is a moderate price appreciation. That's just going to chug along, right? Yeah. Until, until okay. the depth of our buyer pool comes online. Right. Yeah. But so, so at what point does do interest, I mean, like interest rates could rise, say they rise to five, five and a half even. And then you're starting to see, you're starting to see pressure on price appreciation just because of uh, uh, purchasing power. Yeah. yeah. But do you believe there's still enough demand that there still will chug along? I think there is because I don't think there's going to be enough inventory. Yeah. And, and, and there's, it's, it's like an elastic, it's like a, it's like a, a rubber band, right? It, it'll go as much as it can until you stretch it to its limit and it breaks. And then once it breaks, the price is going to have to compensate, you know, and we're going to have to try to figure this out. We're going to have to have another conversation. What I like to say is we'll have to have another conversation. You know, I, I don't see, here's what I think. I don't think the fed funds is, I don't think they're hiking. 
All right, the Fed right now is about 200, 250 basis points behind the curve. That's, that's, that's a lot of, all right, uh, that's, that's minimum, okay? And I don't think they're going to hike that much <laughs> because I think what's going to happen is they'll hike most, most of that. And then I think the market will do the rest of it for them um, through a tantrum or something else, something will change. And they're like, ah, we got to slow this down a little bit. But ultimately, after we get through that, if you look a year down the road, I think that they're, they're basically, they got to give themselves bullets for the next round of deflation. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're not out of this deflationary wave. You are in a reflationary, a reflationary wave that's causing massive reflation in a lot of these risk assets. Um, and you're seeing the downfall in some growth stocks that are getting hit after the Fed injected all this, you know, money and everything. So really, it was deflation. And then they reflated, you know, and you see this big wave. And there's consequences to that. And you already see some stocks out 70, 80 percent. Like that already you, happened. You don't think the yeah. Fed overcompensates and accelerates the, these changes because they cannot afford interest rates to go to five and a half. They can't afford I, it. What was the last time the Fed got something right? I mean, like the only thing that's guaranteed in life is death, taxes, and a Fed policy error. You know what I'm saying? Like, After the I, Fed didn't move quickly during, say, the 08, they did move very quickly and very That was long. correct. That was correct. But they should have, with, we should not be, they should have never allowed, um, and I'm sorry if I'm a little angry here, because this, this, this could have been avoided. This could have been avoided. They could have taken the gas off last summer. The Fed has shown in the last year that they are capable of acting very quickly. They did yes. with, uh, so- I, I, I wouldn't they, say it's impossible. But they can't. No, they can't now. See, now that's the thing. Now they're trapped, right? Now they're kind of trapped because they have not They have to hike. They have to hike. They got inflation. That's the thing. If they need to hike, they'll hike and quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really curious. I really wonder where they bring, this is like what FinTwit is really talking about, is like, what is the Fed going to do? Um, is, this a, is this a weaponization war of commodities and resources? Is everyone going into protection of isolation mode? What I hear you say, it doesn't matter how much they hike, that real estate in New York is, got, is going to travel along a bit of an inevitable curve. Regardless of what the Fed does, there's demand, there's not enough supply. And, the, and, and that trajectory is not profoundly affected by interest rates or the war or, supply, or, or I don't think in the, in the next three to five years that I'm calling for this, this secular call, I don't think it's going to be affected by interest. I think interest rates will go up during this cycle. But ultimately, I think they're going to wave down through through deflationary kind of things. And I don't think that, I don't think you're going to have a 10 year treasury going to five or six percent in the next two years. I don't think could be mm -hmm. wrong. I don't think where we two percent now. That would be so. That means something really changed. We got to have another conversation, and you never know. But like, I just don't think that's going to happen. Black Swan event. Or, I mean, that that is that how we end it with we have to have another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Both you fun. get Roberto on your podcast, uh, Talking Manhattan. Yeah, we have Roberto's always welcome on that. Yeah, Roberto's always welcome. Noah, thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy you came on. And thanks thank for having you. me. And thank you from Connecticut. We are jealous. We wish we had the tools that you're offering <laughs> in Manhattan. Uh, maybe you'll come out here. You know what? There's plenty of room for you to come out here and do what you yeah. do in Connecticut. We could use a little bit of Noah out here. Yeah, one day. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Very nice to see you, John and Roberto. And thanks for having me. Scott, thank thanks. It's fun. Guys, it's great. And tomorrow guys. is? Friday. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you, Scott Hobbs. Exactly. Cheers. Well, thank week, you, Scott. Next thank week, you, Scott. everybody, no, we've got the, the governor. Everything. We've yeah. got the governor of Connecticut, Lamont. So think of your questions and send them to me. And uh, and I hope I see you all next week. All right. Bye.